In my video on Russian and Ukrainian tank numbers back in October, I stated in early 2023 you would start hearing about the need to send Western-built tanks to Ukraine. Well, on 14th of January 2023, it was confirmed that the United Kingdom was sending a squadron of 14 Challenger 2s to Ukraine. Less than two weeks later, Germany permitted European countries to donate Leopard 2s to Ukraine as well, and the United States promised 31 Abrams tanks. Many have signalled this to be a game changer in the war, others that it's better late than never. But what's the truth? Welcome to the Watchman's Broadcast and today we will be looking at the effectiveness of the NATO tanks Ukraine will receive in the near future and how they will impact the war with Russia overall. We will start by looking at the first NATO tank offered to Ukraine, the British Challenger 2. Starting with the positives, the Challenger 2 is one of, if not the most heavily armoured tanks in the world. Sporting the natively developed second generation Chobham armour, the strongest ceramic tank armour in the world, the actual specifications of the Challenger 2's protective levels is classified, though I've heard determined War Thunder gamers have leaked its true statistics. However, what we know for certain is that Challenger 2's were hit by 15, 60 and on one occasion 70 RPGs in Iraq and remained combat effective. To this day, it is the only tank currently in service in the world that has seen combat and has not been destroyed by enemy fire, which is by any measure proof it is a very well protected tank. Its 120mm rifle gun was designed specifically to destroy the late Soviet era tanks, such as the T-72B and T-80B, which just so happened to be the two most common tanks used in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Though it is one of the slowest tanks in the world, with a top speed of 35 miles per hour, it can travel 25 miles an hour across country and has good tactical manoeuvrability for its size. This is where the negatives come in for the Challenger 2, however, starting with its sheer size. Now, we do not know if the Ukrainians will receive the base variant of the Challenger 2 or one of its armour upgrade packages, but even at its base weight, it is a 65 tonne tank and 72 tonnes with additional armour. This is a monstrous weight, and while the tank may be versatile for its size, it will certainly be a hindrance in Ukraine. Both sides in this war ceased major offensive operations in December due to the muddy season, or Rasputitsa, which makes the soil unsuitable for tanks and have been waiting for the ground to freeze in order to bear their weight for further operations. Even Russian tank crews, when applauding the new T-90Ms they have now been supplied with in notable numbers, did acknowledge it was a very heavy tank at 48 tonnes and easily churned up the ground, making it awkward to manoeuvre and it is the heaviest tank currently in Ukraine. This indicates a 65 tonne tank would be near impossible to move in these conditions. Not to mention, this would put considerable wear on the Challenger 2's engine, meaning it would need intensive maintenance, especially as the Challenger 2 has tended to have a satisfactory rather than good reputation for its engine throughout its life. As for the gun, though it will be effective against all T-72 variants, as even the B-3 has had almost no additional protection against anti-tank Sable projectiles, the later T-80BVM and the T-90M in a front-on engagement would likely be able to weather hits from the Challenger 2. Its Charm 3 AP FSDS round was state-of-the-art when it entered service in 1998, but there has been no effort to modernise the tank-killing abilities of the Challenger 2 since it was first built. While still a decent round, it has been left behind and the latest Russian Sabos are superior, though the Challenger 2's armour will likely still give it the advantage. However, tank-on-tank -tank engagements in this war have taken a back seat compared to the role of being an assault gun in providing support for infantry. The Challenger 2, due to its rifle gun, fires HESH rounds rather than the standard high explosive. Though perfect for bunkers and urban strongpoints, due to its breach charge abilities, in open fields its blast radius is very limited, meaning the tanks Ukraine has are better suited for fire support missions. The biggest drawback of the gun however is the fact it's rifled. All other tanks in NATO and indeed throughout much of the world operate smoothbore guns. Consequently, no other shell in the world aside from those produced in Britain for the Challenger can be used in it. The British MOD is also believed to have stopped producing shells for the Challenger 2 in sufficient quantities since 2010, which was when the British Army left Iraq and deemed tanks a low priority for modern warfare. History, it seems, has a sense of irony. 
Therefore, while it would certainly prevail against most tanks it would encounter, aside from being a good tank hunter and offering good crew survivability, the challenger's drawbacks would equalise its benefits in other roles and it is unlikely it can be kept running for a long period of time, especially as the Challenger 2 is no longer in production and every tank lost could not be replaced. A tank that could rectify some of these deficiencies is the American M1 Abrams. Like the Challenger, the Abrams sports Trubham armour and is the only other tank in the world to possess it, and though it has suffered losses in Iraq to insurgents, the Abrams has seen more use and produced a good crew survivability record. Even the M1A1 Abrams with first generation Chubham is generally better protected than the T-80Us and T-90As operated by the Russians. The Abrams also possesses the L44 M256 120mm smoothbore gun, which is essentially the standard tank gun of NATO, meaning ammunition is widely available and produced by numerous manufacturers from the USA to Europe, so resupply would be far less of a concern for Ukraine. The Americans have also invested in updating their ammunition and its Sabre rounds are as good as, if not better than the Challengers, and aside from perhaps the T-90M, most Russian tanks would be at a disadvantage when engaging the Abrams in straight fights. It can also fire heat rounds, which are better suited for infantry targets, though again, not quite as effective as HE Frag the Ukrainians have on their own tanks. America also has hundreds in storage, and the tank is still in production, so a supply of spare parts or replacement vehicles would be readily available to Ukraine, though it would take weeks for these to get from America to Ukraine, simply due to geography. The tank also has a gas turbine engine, meaning it can carry the weight of the Chubham the way the Challenger cannot, with a top speed of 41 miles power, giving it great mobility on the battlefield. Again, however, this is where the benefits of the Abrams ends and its logistical problems start to rival, if not outmatch, the Challenger 2s. The Abrams tends to weigh 60 tonnes or more, depending on the variant. Though lighter than the Challenger, it is still notably heavier than anything in Ukraine, and thus still not really suited to the soft terrain. Its gas turbine engine also has more in common with a helicopter engine than a tank, and requires more specialised maintenance when needing repair. Not something you want when it is stuck in the mud in minus 5 degrees. The Abrams has never fought out in the fields for weeks or months on end, where quick rudimental fixes are needed to keep it running and first rate facilities and services have been denied to it. It also has a notable increase in fuel consumption, requiring over 100 gallons more fuel than the Challenger 2 to fill up and nearly 200 gallons more than the T-72s and T-64s operated by Ukraine or a roughly 50% increase per tank. Neither of these factors have ever been a problem for the Abrams as it has been operated by the United States Army, the most well-funded military force on the planet, and it has fought in wars against insurgents of the third-rate Iraqi army for little more than a few weeks in the field, in open deserts with full combined arms support from air power, ensuring no threat to the logistics train. Ukraine does not have that luxury, with destroyed bridges, dirt tracks and ever-present Russian artillery barrages, it cannot ensure such quantities of fuel would be able to reach the Abrams given the intensity of the conflict, especially in offensive operations. Thus, for all its technical superiority, I'm of the opinion it would quickly fall into disrepair in Ukraine as only American infrastructure could afford to maintain such a technologically advanced tank and even then, this is assuming the Russians would be so obliging as to not directly attack this support network. Not to mention, the tank itself is not invulnerable, and while it will be better than most Russian tanks in most scenarios, as already discussed, tanks are not the main enemy of other tanks in this war. Over 100 Abrams tanks have been written off or outright destroyed in combat, mainly fighting insurgents equipped with reasonable RPGs and anti-tank guided missiles of late Soviet design so the modern Russian ground forces would most certainly be able to do the same level of damage with their infantry anti-tank weapons, while also adding the occasional lucky artillery hit or patrolling helicopter gunship to that attrition rate, any Abrams force in Ukraine will inevitably suffer notable casualties. I am of the belief that like the German heavy panzers of World War II, Abrams tanks would prove superior to their adversaries in direct combat, but through lack of fuel, and over-engineering that requires extensive repair time, it would ultimately prove strategically a minor benefit to Ukraine. 
Now, it is for this reason I believe not only Ukrainians, but even the Americans desire this third NATO tank above all others to be sent to Ukraine, and that is the German Leopard 2. It is armed with the L-44 Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore gun, the same as the Abrams, meaning supplying ammunition is not a problem, and again, it can contend with all Russian tanks. The Leopard 2 also has a superior engine performance to the Challenger and the Abrams, able to travel at 44 miles per hour across the roads and comfortably over 30 miles an hour across country and in reverse as well, giving it an almost unparalleled mobility over anything in Ukraine. It is also a diesel engine and not significantly more complex to work on and uses the same amount of fuel as the Soviet era tanks operated by Ukraine. Though still heavy at 55 tonnes for the Leopard 2A4 variant, operated by the Poles and indeed most of Europe, it is lighter than most Western tanks and therefore the best suited for the changeable terrain and damaged road infrastructure of Ukraine. It is less well protected than the Abrams and the Challenger, though its composite armour is still superior against RPGs and anti-tank missiles than the armour on Russian tanks with the exception of maybe the T-80BVM and the T-90M and also easier to repair if damaged as the process is more conventional than Chubham. Against other tanks, its armour has the edge over Russian vehicles, but the Leopard 2A4 variant in particular, which is likely what Ukraine would receive, as it is what Poland operates and is the most numerous, would be equally vulnerable to Russian tank fire. The later Leopard 2A6 and Leopard 2A7s would be a different story in frontal engagements however, and that has a more powerful gun, that only the T90M would be able to effectively contend with. Regardless of the model though, the Leopard 2 would be the easiest to repair and maintain. Conveniently, unlike the Challenger or the Abrams, where new tanks must come from only these countries, some 18 countries have operated the Leopard 2, essentially making it the European tank. So replacement parts, and indeed vehicles, are in no short supply. Ultimately though, while the Leopard 2 is the best candidate for Ukraine, there is an inescapable problem it faces along with the Challenger 2 and the Abrams, and that is training the Ukrainians to operate them. Now, the Ukrainians are very capable of manning these tanks. They are now the most combat experienced tank force in Europe, but NATO tanks do not in any way resemble the Soviet-derived vehicles they are familiar with. Training a good tank crew takes at least six months, and to familiarize the Ukrainians with new engines, new optics, electronics, comms, gears, etc. will take at least that time. Not to mention, NATO is supplying three different types of tank. As logistically problematic as these NATO tanks are to the Ukrainian ground forces logistical support, this is then heightened by the fact all have different parts, one has different ammo, and all have different fuel requirements. Forming these units into a unified tank force will be difficult, and in all honesty, I very much doubt the Ukrainians will be able to operate hundreds at a time, given the ad hoc nature of a dozen tanks in one delivery or 30 in the next, especially when casualties are taken into account. Though they are better than the Russian vehicles, they are not superior to the extent the German Tigers and Tiger IIs were in the Second World War over Allied tanks, and Germany made over 1,800 of them and still lost the war. I therefore do not think several dozen NATO main battle tanks will significantly influence the outcome of a war where over 2,000 tanks have been lost in a year-long conflict. If NATO truly wants to see its tanks make a difference, it must commit to a single model, deliver them by the hundreds in a single batch, and do it now. Something I cannot see on the political horizon, unlike the Russian offensive that is gaining momentum on the Zaporizhia front. Thank you all for watching this episode of the Watchman's Broadcast. If you want to see more military analysis like this, please see my previous video on the Ukrainian and Russian tank losses and their remaining numbers in the Ukraine war. Please like and subscribe for more content and have a pleasant day.